بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم صل على سيدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم في الأولين وصلي اللهم وسلم وبارك على حبيبنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم في الآخرين اللهم صل وسلم على حبيبنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم كل ما ذكره ذاكر الأبرار وكل ما غفر ذكره الغافرون all praises due to Allah subhanahu wa taala who knows what we reveal and knows what we conceal and even knows what the animals feel we thank him we praise him and on him we have reliance that is to him we only turn to for true guidance we ask him to send his peace his blessings his mercy on the best of human beings and prophets Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم on whom be praise until the very end of our days we ask him for steadfastness guidance mercy and to never lead us astray and for him to save us on judgment day welcome everybody alhamdulillah to uh, the first session in discussing uh, the book by the great scholar and zahida and ascetic and uh, scholar of spirituality aisha al ba'uniya uh, rahimahullah ta'ala who passed away in 1517 ce uh, and she passed away in 923 hijra uh, which uh, is over uh, about approximately you know 503 years ago 503 years ago this great scholar a, a woman who was known as one of the greatest um, scholars in terms of contribution uh, for women in the uh, 16th century. Uh, she lived in a time where there was a uh, sira, there was an internal kind of schism between uh, two groups of Muslims, uh, the Ottoman Empire and the Mamluk, uh, where they were fighting over uh, domination uh, and she lived and was from a well-known Syrian family uh, in, And even though her origins uh, are from Jordan So uh, a well-known Jordanian family, Ba'un uh, And they settled in Syria uh, Where she was born in Damascus And she eventually passed away in Damascus uh, This book that we're going to go over um, Is actually called Al-Muntakhab Al-Muntakhab uh, Fi usul al-rutab Fi ilm al-tasawwuf Which is basically the elect In the principles of uh, the stations In the knowledge of tasawwuf The knowledge of uh, spirituality uh, One of the things that you know, led me to um, Actually want to do this book Is two reasons Number one is how many people have said That they don't see the contributions of women uh, and this is something that you know makes a lot of people sad. Where where are the contributions of women, and how we don't highlight the contributions of women? And in fact, this this scholar is well known uh, in terms of her um, contributions, as well as her poetry and her uh, fiqh. She was a Shafi'i scholar, um, and uh, she also was given positions in uh, ifta in the Mamluk uh, Empire in Cairo, and then as well uh, as a teaching position in. Um, in uh, Aleppo and then subsequently uh, Damascus where she passed away Rahimahullah ta'ala And uh, we wanted to discuss a book in spirituality And this book, subhanAllah, she, it's very comprehensive in how she discusses And because she's a poet and she's known for her poetry That even some of her, some of her uh, poetry has actually been used in songs, Arabic songs Because of her beautiful um, uh, you know, uh, theme and style and approach uh, in discussing uh, discussing spirituality and uh, particularly she's known for Madaih uh, nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam her poems about the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wa which we'll discuss uh, we decided to call this class the principles of spirituality for a number of reasons, reasons. number one the words uh, tasawwuf sometimes is a misnomer and sometimes is misunderstood by by a number of people so what does it reflect on or what does it mean when we when we speak about tasawwuf and what does that entail in and of itself so the word tasawuf essentially is spirituality. And there's a number of words that were used in this. And the word in the Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala use, uses is uh, tazkiyah. Uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, seeks for us to purify ourselves. Uh, so this is another word that's used. Another word that's used is suruk. Okay? So in essence, the uh, Muslim ummah uh, definitely focused on an element of spirituality which... Uh, later on developed and took its own approach And this approach is something that was built in, in schools of understanding spirituality Just like there's schools of understanding uh, faith Just like there's schools in understanding fiqh uh, and, and schools of theology, understanding the nature of Allah Azza wa Jal Of the nature of God, understanding how to uh, understand His divine attributes And also to... Um, 
respond to any kind of uh, heterodox uh, beliefs, beliefs that are outside of the fold of Islam, for example, from uh, Greek uh, philosophy or any kind of philosophy that existed outside of uh, Islam, whether it be Eastern, Far East, or it be uh, from uh, the European countries or from uh, the African countries, anything that would go against uh, the Islamic um, beliefs, responding to that under kalam or, or um, a theological discourse and aqidah. Uh, and then there's schools that came about in terms of spirituality. And these schools essentially created um, programs or you could say models in which how they reflected over how spirituality is attained. So how spirituality is attained is something that every single believer seeks. And then they differed over how to go about that process. From the, those schools or those methods, uh, certain teachers started to have students. And those students then started to say, the approach of such and such teacher is our school. So for example, then you had, then you had formalized approaches in schools to spirituality. And, uh, and more or less, some of these schools uh, were acceptable by, by the great corpus of Islamic practices. And others, they adopted practices which became uh, a moment of contention. A, a moment of contention in the practice itself, uh, the method, and these schools became known as the schools of tasawwuf, and there was a great schism in, in, in Islamic history over uh, approaching them. So they, they went from elements of acceptability to elements of contention and practice in some of these uh, uh, schools and practices. For example, like setting formulas in adhkar and remembrances of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, like doing a particular uh, act uh, for a very long time. Or, and then even more contentious, like repeating the name of Allah, mujarradan, meaning just the name of Allah in, in, in long periods of time, and so on and so, and, uh, and so forth. So these elements of contention is what led some of the scholars to actually go back and say, let us reflect over some of these elements that people have adopted and go back empirically, empirical spirituality, empirical Sufism, in essence to do away that which goes against uh, the practices of the earlier generations or what was practiced by scholars previous to this uh, school being formatted uh, and not even maybe even the, the founders of the school even did and then to uh, draw out what our faith essentially teaches. And that is empirical spirituality, empirical tasawwuf, practical spirituality. And uh, many scholars wrote on this, that they never adopted a particular school, but they called for the aspect of rectification that is found within our faith, uh, and that existed. Now this does not mean that they necessarily uh, spoke out against the idea of having schools of, of spirituality. But that is something that a number of, of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, scholars, uh, they followed this trend of not adopting a particular school of tasawwuf and, uh, uh, result and uh, accepting having a teacher, but not necessarily giving them allegiance or, or a methodology that may or may not contradict an aspect of earlier uh, spirituality that we don't have a source from. For example, like setting particular formulas of prayers, but rather saying that our spirituality should be general. And that is, uh, in essence, the view that I hold personally. Uh, empirical spirituality, practical spirituality that is agreed upon by the entire ummah. The spirituality of Imam al-Ghazali, rahimahullah, the spirituality of Ibn Rajab, Imam al-Nawi, Ibn, uh, Ibn al-Qayyim, and uh, Ibn al-Jawzi, and all of these scholars which did not call to a particular uh, school And then you have uh, scholars such as like Ibn Ata'illah al-Iskandarani Which attributed himself to a school, the Shadari school And uh, scholars like uh, you had uh, uh, Imam al-Shadari himself for example has works And others who attributed themselves to schools And this shows you that there's a breadth of a spectrum That we may not necessarily agree with every aspect of uh, elements of spirituality, but the overarching themes are something that we all accept that are from Islam. So we take the good and those that we don't agree with, we, we don't necessarily uh, do away with all of uh, that, is, that is contentious, but accept the good and you know, leave that which is, we don't find agreeable. And that is why Imam al-Ghazali rahimahullah, said that uh, your spirituality, your tasawwuf should have 
and stem from knowledge, ilm, meaning it has to have evidence. It has to, has, has to come from an epistemic understanding from someone, a scholar. Who did, who did you get this from? So that's why some of the elements of these schools of tasawwuf went so far uh, away from the crux of the Quran and Sunnah that they went into esoteric understandings of spirituality. And that's when you get this genre or this group which uh, spoke about mysticism. And then these uh, elements of symbolism and allegory which r- essentially renders the uh, meaning of the Quran and Sunnah useless because these understandings, they divided between two, that which is apparent and that which is hidden. So all these hidden symbolic understandings that we sometimes read uh, from Ibn Arabi, for example, you read from uh, uh, others, uh, Halaj, and, and the, the ones that speak about an inner meaning and an outer meaning and a deeper meaning and a, and a uh, superficial meaning. Uh, these elements of esoteric mysticism is something that went further and further away from what uh, the crux of the Quran and Sunnah was, right? And the meaning of the Quran and Sunnah is that it's, it's something that everyone should understand. Spirituality shouldn't be so symbolic that it's stripped away from the context and the tafsir, the meanings that Allah intended, and we can prove, we can understand. This came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this came from the Messenger, this came from those who understand and witnessed revelation, and that's where we can then uh, use it as a rubric whether a, a interpretation and a symbolism is acceptable or not. So I just want to make sure that this understanding is very clear to all of us, that uh, we should be balanced. We should understand spirituality in a way that is derived from our faith, in a way that we can move forward, in a way that, can, that is practical to our day-to-day lives. And that is, that is the view that I hold, and I call it empirical uh, Sufism, empirical uh, spirituality, principles of spirituality, practical spirituality, whatever you want to call it, this is where we, uh, we stem from. And this does not mean that we can't benefit from like Ibn Ata'illah, rahimahullah ta'ala, who spoke from a school, this does not mean we cannot benefit from Aisha al Ba'uniya, who is a woman who belonged to the Qadiri school of Tasawwuf. She was a Shafi'i scholar, and she lived in a time where essentially the Ummah was all involved in schools of spirituality. And this was something that was a norm. There was a norm in among people that they generally attributed themselves to some kind of school of spirituality because that's what they found refined, refined faith. So you had a teacher, the essence and the principle is the same. You had a teacher that would check your spirituality, that would uh, help you to develop yourself, that you would listen to and you would seek advice from. And this is something that I, I want you all to understand. The fact that we're separated from this, or we found teachers that are irrelevant to us, who don't speak our language, don't understand our realities, that how, how in essence can we then practice, practice a spirituality which is relevant to us? And with the advent of everything becoming digital, including relationships, and that becomes increasingly problematic. So that element is part of part of Islam. Even the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu was given the story of Khadr, or Khidr, excuse me, with uh, Musa alayhi salam. A prophet even had or was taught by another, which was the famous story in Surah Al-Kahf, where Musa would be taught by this man, this righteous. Some scholars say even was a prophet. Khidr uh, alayhi salam and, uh, on Musa and our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So that aspect is something that's true. That's why we're going to go through this book. But first and foremost, we have to understand who, why are we even going through this? Okay? Uh, and this is extremely important because we have to understand uh, who Aisha al-Ba'uniya was. And why is she so important for us to, to study? So Aisha al-Ba'uniya, uh, this book that, sh- that, is, um, that we're going over has is, is, uh, been um, translated by a Western academic uh, organization or group called uh, the Library of Arabic Literature. It's, you can buy it online. Uh, it has been translated and annot- annotated by uh, Thomas Emil H- Homerin. And uh, I want to just, you know, when we talk about Aisha al-Ba'uniya, they're looking at it from a very Western uh, academic perspective. So a lot of the uh, references that they make is this uh, infatuation with Western Academy, with... Uh, Mysticism, and they, they differentiate spirituality between mysticism and that which is uh, what we define as practical practical faith and uh, spirituality that stems from the Quran and Sunnah, that, that which we take. So this element of discussing constantly mysticism is the Western academic approach, which separates from 
the aspect of Islam which we say is part and intrinsic of it. Um, and I think there's, there's, there's a, a few uh, issues with that aspect uh, of trying to define uh, Sufism as something outside of Islam. So there's a mystical understanding of Islam and then there is a you know, ruling ba- based understanding of Islam. And this is 100% wrong. Okay? Any mystical approach, as Imam al-Ghazali said, be aware of tafahut as which means be aware of the esoteric understandings of the Sufis. So anyone from, from Muslims who starts going to such symbolism that the, the, the rulings or the mechanics of Islam become lost, that's not true spirituality. That symbolism is not true. And whoever goes into such mechanics where they don't take into account uh, uh, personal uh, spirituality and, and practical faith and growing and elevating someone's uh, spirituality, then that's not true Islam either. So no extreme in mechanics and no extreme in, uh, in metaphysics. And people say we, we need to look at the spirit of Islam, but the spirit of Islam cannot be, cannot be practiced without its, without its uh, actions. And the actions of Islam cannot be practiced without its objectives so in spirituality. So this is something I want you all to just keep in mind all the time. And this is something Western Academy constantly tries to develop and, and, uh, and, uh, and focus on, that there's a, a mystical understanding of Islam, and then there's a normative uh, understanding of Islam. Or not only that, they create an entire genre uh, speaking about mysticism. So uh, Hammerin uh, gives an introduction on Aisha al baruniya um, saying that she was born in Damascus in the second half of the 15th century. She came from a long line of religious scholars and poets, originally from the small village of Ba'un in, uh, in, in, in Jordan. Ba'un is in Jordan, so he made a mistake here. It's not southern Syria, it's, it's Jordan in essence today. In search of education and employment, members of the Ba'uni family eventually made their way to Damascus, and for several, several generations they served the Mamluk sultans of Egypt and Syria. The Mamluk are Turkic. So they lived in a time when there was a, they were reaching the convergence between the Ottomans taking over and the Mamluk Empire being stripped from, from power. So they lived in, under the, uh, the Mamluk, the Mamluk Sultanate. Okay? Aisha's father Yusuf, uh, who passed away in 1475, okay, was a scholar of Shafi'i jurisprudence and rose to prominence as the chief judge in Damascus. So she comes from a family of scholars. This is not just... Uh, people who only talk about spirituality, because remember, spirituality must stem from knowledge. Just put that in your mind. Our spirituality and faith stems from stems from knowledge. Okay. He made sure that all of his children received a fine education. Aisha, together with her, with her five brothers, uh, studied the Quran, the traditions of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Fiqh. She became a faqiha. She understands it very well, and she memorized the Quran at the age of eight. So this teaches you what a righteous family focuses on, right? It's not just about, hey, make sure you get your A's, go get your Ivy League uh, education, get into Oxford and Cambridge and whatever. And then there's, no, there's literally no knowledge of Islam, none. Besides your Sunday school, this is, complete, this is completely not, not okay. That's what actually has led to the decline of intellectual strength and understanding of Islam. When you had so many of our uh, religious right, leadership, not know anything in terms of their intellectual veracity and strength. So when you don't have the uh, heads of the ummah who understand faith and religion, be the most smartest and intellectual. It, and, and, and you take your children who are supposed to be, you know, the level of doctors and etc. And you bring them to a religious education. This is what leads to decline as well. And that's why Imam Shafi'i says one of the conditions of knowledge is that well, someone has intellect. Okay, IQ, like you can't just take people that don't understand anything, don't have the ability to critically uh, think and analyze, and then give them the responsibility of others. This is not appropriate. So you see from this family, uh, the the Ba'un family and her father Yusuf, who focused on giving the best education not only to the the, the men, but the young women. She became a faqiha, and she said, I... I, I, uh, I studied all of the sciences and, and I started to study in with my father and memorized the uh, Quran at the age of eight. Uh, she also went on uh, a, a pilgrimage uh, later on. But before that, um, she married uh, a, a man by the name of Ahmed 
uh, who came from uh, the family of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So uh, she, her children uh, that she had, uh, one of them was Abdul Wahab, and the other one was name was Baraka. Uh, she wrote extensively about the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in praises and poetry, uh, and she has a beautiful book called Al Khafiyat Al Ilahiya fi Manazil Al Aliya, which is uh, a breakdown of poetry of. Uh, uh, Ismail al harawis book, Manazil al sairin which is a book on spirituality, the stations of the seekers, which has just been translated and commented by Dr. Hatim al-Hajj. Uh, and it's, been, it's available on Amazon now, it's been translated. She did a poetry version of that book. Okay, That book is on spirituality, so she, she wrote on everything. Uh, when she went to the Hajj pilgrimage, she, um, she said that uh, I was essentially sitting... On Friday night, I reclined on a couch in an enclosed veranda overlooking the holy Kaaba and the sacred uh, precinct where people were there. It so happened that there was a man reading a poem on the life of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, and here's salawat or madaih on the Nabi ﷺ. So this was read regularly in Masjid al-Haram and there's nothing wrong with that. He, she, she says, voices rose with, the, with singing salawat. People were saying the salawat on the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She said, I, couldn't, uh, I could not um, uh, keep my eyes open and I fell asleep. So she said, when I fell asleep, she said, I, it was as if I was standing among a group of women or a group of people. Someone said, kiss the Prophet. And she said that a, a shock came to, over me that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was there. She said it made me, it made me almost pass out at the, at the realization that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is there, until the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam passed by me. So I, I, she said in a stammering tongue, she said, "Ya Rasulullah, I ask you for you to remember me in your in seeking intercession, to give me your intercession, Ya Rasulullah." And uh, I heard him say calmly and deliberately, "Ana." I am the one that grants intercession with tarasul. Tarasul is like calm, uh, calmness and gentleness, and tarsil is like a very beautiful, slow recitation. Meaning what? There is no, there's no, go, there's not going to be any force. There's not going to be any kind of um, anxiety. Inshallah, I will be the intercessor with calmness, gentleness, and in a way which will do away with everyone's anxiety and shock. A beautiful way that she heard the Prophet Muhammad say this in her dream. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us that. So she studied in her education, and she, uh, uh, again, uh, was under the tutelage of teachers. Her two teachers that had a lot of impact on her were Jamal al-Din Ismail Hawari and Muhyiddin Yahya al-Urmawi. Uh, and, she, and she said, my education and development, my spiritual eff- effacement and purification occurred by the helping hand of the Sultan of the saints of his time, uh, Ismail al-Hawari. May Allah sanctify his heart and be pleased with him. And then by the helping hand of his successor in spiritual states and stations and in spiritual proximity and union, Muhyiddin Yahya al-Urmawi. May Allah continue to spread his ever-growing spiritual blessings throughout his lifetime and join us at every moment his blessings and sukr. So, uh, I want you to understand something. Spirituality is levels. This is what they call the stations, manazil. And this is why every single group of scholars, they wrote about the stations of spirituality, the station of patience, the stations of hope, the station of overcoming, the station of ujb, uh, uh, self-amazement and and being impressed by yourself, how to overcome these things. And they usually divide it into two categories. Things or diseases of the heart that you need to remove and... Uh, uh, noble character and, 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 and uh, things that you need to beautify. So what they call that is tasfiya wa tahliya, which is to remove bad characteristics and then to beautify it with good characteristics. And for that, they took on teachers that would help them in overcoming and teaching these stations. That essentially what spirituality was. And this is from collecting the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu statements. It doesn't come from random, a person just sitting there and reflecting spirituality today. And you have these book of uh, quotes of random uh, saints and spirits. That's not how things work. But rather it comes directly from the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu uh, The next session I will show you a book 
which a great Turkish scholar by the name of Imam al Birgavi uh, wrote in response to a lot of the disagreements that were happening, happening in, the, in Turkey at that time with the different spiritual schools of Tasawwuf. So you had Qadiri and Chisti and Shadri and so on and so forth. These, these uh, groups started to then lose the plot in some sense and started to argue with one another who was better. And all of them stem from the same, we're trying to figure out how to spiritually cleanse. Do you know how amazing it is that we're fighting over who is the best school in spiritually cleansing ourselves? All of them are what? Are a means. They're not an objective. You don't get your card and say, okay, alhamdulillah, now this is my ticket to Jannah. We don't, that's not in our faith. So what he did is he wrote a book called Al-Tariqatul Muhammadiyah. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa tariqa or school or way of spirituality. And he took all of, the, uh, all of the levels that are practiced in these spiritual schools, the stations, and then he just simply added only the, the, the uh, Quranic ayat for guidance or the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's statement. To say, look, forget all of, you're losing the plot, you're losing the whole purpose behind why we're doing all of this. We're trying to seek nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through this means of having a teacher. The teacher is not the means, neither is the school. So similarly, uh, I want you all to understand the, uh, the concept behind what the school entails. Meaning you have a teacher who then will teach these levels and such and such. As long as a person has uh, teachers, that's the main point. Not to ascribe names to yourself and then the whole point becomes a name. You have a certain dress, you, you wear a particular color ring and uh, you know, it becomes like almost like a... Uh, a, a specific way that, that, you, that you have to, uh, like, almost like a uniform, this is, uh, this we should stay away from in general. We should stay away from general because it makes us lose, us lose the point behind what spirituality is intended for. Having a teacher, being sincere to them, and uh, so on and so forth is important. Uh, but then to have this uh, f- fanatic understanding is, 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 is problematic. So she, eventually what she does is she, um, uh, they moved, to, they left Damascus for Cairo, uh, and uh, to seek a job for him in the Mamluk administration because that's where the center of the Mamluks were. And in route, what happens? Bandits actually attack their caravan and they took all of her books. Rahimahullah. Like they took everything she wrote for the most part. So a lot of her books are actually lost. A lot of her books are actually lost, but alhamdulillah, the ones, uh, among the ones that survive are the ones that we're going to be covering. Um, in any case, she basically reached a high station to the extent when she stayed in Egypt and Cairo, she became a, a, a person that would write fatwa. She would write fatwa in Egypt. And she was a person who, who became very well known for her poetry that became published because one of the general secretaries, Ibn Aja, was a direct uh, a secretary, confidential secretary or advisor to the Mamluk Sultan. Al-Ghawri. So, so she was now in the higher upper, up, upper echelon court of the Mamluks. In essence, uh, when she starts writing, uh, and uh, Ghawri actually, the Sultan, met with Aisha, and she be- he became very fond of her Arabic poetry, and uh, this is partly one of the reasons why uh, it spread. Her, her works were spread, and her, her works were written, and so on and so forth. And she has a number of books that you can read in the beginning of, uh, of the... Uh, um, uh, translation of this of this book. Now, the book that we're currently doing is is excellent. Okay, it's an excellent uh, summary, and that's why she's called she called it Al Muntakhab, the elect or selected, fi uh, usul al rutab, meaning the the select or elect of the principles of the stations, fi ilm in the in, in in the principles of spirituality. So the book is really good. What she says in this book, she compares spirituality to a tree with many branches. So it has many branches. Spirituality, so there's so many things we can do. But it has four essential roots, four essential principles. So you have this giant tree, it has four main roots. Those roots are number one, repentance, tawbah. Number two, sincerity, ikhlas. Number three, remembrance, dhikr. And number four, Love, mahabba. These are the four roots of spirituality. That she, what she does is she discusses each principle, each of these four roots in great detail in separate sections, beginning each section with relevance from uh, relevant uh, verses from the Quran, and um, then uh, commentaries from other spiritual uh, scholars, 
And then she quotes a number of prophetic ahadith, carefully noting her sources in most instances, demonstrating once again her extensive knowledge of religious education, and so, so on and so forth. So uh, that is with regards to Aisha al-Ba'uni, rahimahullah ta'ala. She visited uh, Mecca and Medina, like we already mentioned. When she went to Medina, she, at every moment that she spent in Medina, she would recite poetry uh, directed to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam over the fact, uh, some of it is, is extremely, extremely beautiful. Uh, maybe we can read uh, one of them, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, there was a really good book uh, that was written about her uh, in the... Um, uh, Academic press in in, uh, in, in Jordan called Tahawulat al Fikriya fil Alam al Islami. The the uh, changes or the uh, the intellectual um, you could say movements uh, in uh, the Islamic world, and uh, she was mentioned uh, as one of the one of the people that uh, they focused on uh, in, in 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 her particular century. Uh, and uh, Saeed Bawaina, who was a uh, professor in um, in, in hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and hadith sciences in Yarmouk University in, uh, in Jordan. He wrote about her, uh, probably one of the best I've read in terms of detail. Uh, but one of the things that he, he describes is her, um, her traveling to, uh, to Medina uh, and speaking uh, about her experiences extensively. And she would speak about how uh, she would say, uh, Oh, the one who holds the, the possessor of intercession, a, a miskeen, uh, servant of the Lord has come to see you. She carries with her all of her burdens, hoping one day to be forgiven and to be in your presence. So it's an extremely beautiful poem uh, that she writes about, again, the, the madh of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in general. Um, and she has a number of them. Maybe we can share, inshallah, while we read, while we read uh, some of these expenses. One of the things I also wanted to mention is that she was, when she was in Egypt, she... Be, she uh, was a, te- a student and she studied with Ahmed Al-Qistallani. Ahmed Al-Qistallani is one of the greatest scholars of uh, prophetic uh, sila, as well as the qiraat of the Quran and tafsir. So she became one of his students. And that's why, listen, you are known based on this, the teachers that you have. Who are your teachers? Where is your understanding coming from? So you see these people o- online with no names and you don't know where they studied and who their teachers are. This is extremely problematic. Where, you can't just come to Islam with your own understandings, your own derivations. I, I looked at these books and I read this stuff. No. Every, th- every group of people, they carry their understanding from someone. So uh, I, I encourage everyone to, to ask you know, who these people are that you're, that you're listening to. And if you don't know who their teachers are or where they studied, then you should be very careful. No matter how many views that they have on YouTube or whatever, you should be very, very careful of who and what your understanding is coming from because everyone has teachers. Where their teachers come from is extremely important. Um, so this great uh, female scholar studied with Ahmed al-Qistallani. And Ahmed al-Qistallani, he wrote one, one of the most beautiful books on the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called Mawahib al-Laduniyya. Mawahib al-Laduniyya uh, is, is, a, is a beautiful book um, that speaks about uh, the stations of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Its full name I will give you shortly, inshallah. Okay. Mawahib al and then Imam al-Zurqani, I will hear this. Uh, he wrote, Mawahib al Bil Minah al basically the, st- the, the, the roles of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and then Imam al Zurqani he wrote an explanation to this book called Sharh uh, Mawahib al Laduniya, which is one of one of the most beautiful books of, on the seal of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So she was a student of that great scholar, Ahmad al Qistallani. He also wrote a book which is beautiful on the Qiraat of the Quran and their effect of the on the meaning of, of the of the Quran itself. Uh, this tafsir is called لطائف الإشارات لفنون القراءات The subtle, the subtle um, uh, instances or the subtle meanings or the subtle uh, signs in the uh, sciences of the recitations of the Qur'an. So it's a beautiful book. He was the teacher of this great woman. Pardon? Uh, he was a teacher of this great woman. In essence, uh, studied uh, with... Uh, or. He was a teacher of this woman, she studied with him. And then eventually she left Egypt. When she left Egypt and went back to uh, Aleppo, Halab, uh, the uh, Ottoman 
uh, Empire attacked uh, the Mamluk Sultanate and there was a major battle that happened in Aleppo while she was there and this is the uh, Battle of Marj uh, uh, Dabiq the, the Battle of Marj Dabiq uh, which essentially happened um, in uh, 516 uh, and it was 44 kilometers north of uh, Halab uh, Marj uh, Dabiq refers to the meadow of Dabiq Dabiq is a particular area in Syria and uh, they won a decisive battle essentially ending the Mamluk uh, rule uh, was Sultan Salim I defeating uh, the Mamluk Sultan of Ashraf Qansu al Ghori, the one that uh, she had a relationship with meaning knew him and her children and family was under that sultanate so eventually one year thereafter she actually passed away she passed away on uh, the 16th of Dhul-Qi'dah, uh, 1517 um, CE, 1517 CE, Rahimahullah Ta'ala Rahmatan Wasi'ah, she wrote a beautiful and amazing book that inshallah Ta'ala we hope to go through in detail, uh, and I will recite to you one of the poems that uh, talks about how close her, her poetry spoke, speaks about Atifa, like one's emotions, and I, and I want you to understand, among the readings that I've done, this woman's work really stands out, because a woman writing is not like a man, no matter what you're going to say, Okay, a woman writing and her her perspective and appreciation of how her internal reflections are is different than men writing. And remember, this is not Quran and Sunnah. This is her her uh, uh, thoughts and reflections that are, are are interpretations of the Quran and Sunnah and reflections of it. So when you study from different perspectives, especially uh, a man and women, uh, it'll help you to actually have more appreciation. And that is why. It is it's befitting for our, our you know, women to study Islam, study in detail. There's no such thing as clergy in Islam. We benefit from everybody. But you have to reach the level of qualification. Being a man or a woman is not the qualification to speak about Islam. Just because a person's a man or just because a person is a woman. No. Rather, what qualifies somebody is their knowledge. And that's all, that's all a person has to do. Go and study for decades, mashallah, and then when they have that qualification and, and understanding, they're more than welcome to uh, be a person that we go with, uh, take from and reflect. And alhamdulillah, now especially, there's so many that have went to Azhar and studied in, in India and, 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 and uh, Islamic educational institutions, also now in the West, in, 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 in England and in America. And alhamdulillah, we have now voices that are speaking who are traditionally trained and, and qualified and uh, even some who've uh, then furthermore uh, uh, delved and, and, and received uh, Western academic uh, uh, education Which is a great, great Alhamdulillah step Towards the revival of our faith Of critically thinking and analyzing about it So I'll, I'll end inshallah ta'ala with this um, uh, Poem that she, that she wrote uh, With regards to uh, the um, uh, end of the principles of, of, of spirituality She said uh, Allah looked with favor on a group of people So they stayed away from worldly fortunes in love and devotion, they worshipped Him. They surrendered them, themselves with the best of intentions. They gave themselves up to Him and passed away from existence, with nothing left behind them. Then with kindness and compassion, He turned to them and revealed to them His essence. In devotion, I'll just add this because it's trying to make it rhyme. And they lived again, gazing at that living face as His eternal life appeared. Uh, and, and, he, and she ends it with that. And this teaches you what the whole point of this entire spirituality is. What are you trying to do? Your devotion increasing your proximity to the Lord Most High and cleansing your intentions to seek nearness with repentance and therefore increase your love and your sincerity to Him so that He will take care of all of your affairs until you end this life in a manner that you have reach the closest you can to your Lord, earning with that, inshallah ta'ala, His mercy and His love and forgiveness, because your actions are not going to lead you to paradise. Your actions are going to lead you to the love of Allah and His acceptance and mercy, and with His acceptance and mercy, you will enter paradise, and then based on the actions you've done, it will dictate the level in paradise that you have, until you, inshallah ta'ala, will settle there. And the greatest reward of all of that is that you will see your Lord Most High, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that's what she says at the end, they lived again. This is the true life, gazing at that blessed living face of Allah, our Lord and Creator, as His eternal life appeared to them. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, that when we, we give them ma yasha'un, whatever they ask for, وَلَدَيْنَا mazid. Allah says, and then to us, 
will be increase. What is the increase? They say you will see your Lord. And that will make you forget every good you ever had or asked for in this life or in Jannah. May Allah make us of them. And inshallah, this is a, a um, service to this great woman who, who, who spent her entire life writing about the love of the Prophet and the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The love of Allah and the love of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that subhanahu look how, I want you to just think about something. Look how high a station she has that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed us to be in the service of this woman by explaining the book that she does in this blessed city and wherever you are from, from all over the world, whoever listened to this, because Allah loves this woman. May Allah make us like her station that Allah allows our mention to remain where people will pray for us, ask for forgiveness from us, uh, for us, and allow us, inshallah, to be joined with her and all of the righteous, our families, our, our, our wives, or our husbands, uh, and our, our children, and all of the believers with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his family, and all of the companions, and the righteous in the highest levels of Jannah.